So, thanks once again. Okay, the next speaker, the last speaker is Asesh Yoshi from Jane University. And wait for us. And wait for us. Okay, go ahead. All right, thank you. So obviously there's um, considerable interest in understanding correlations in activity between different brain regions. Um, specific regions that are of particular interest are these fMRI-derived resting state networks, um, which are regions of the brain that show high correlation in the bold signal when the subject in is, is in a resting or non-task state. Um, an example of one such resting state network is the default mode network, which is thought to include parts of anterior cingulate, posterior cingulate, um, prefrontal cortex, and other areas as well. So although the results are fairly consistent across numerous fMRI studies, the underlying electrophysiology is not fully understood. And so we chose to use intracranial EEG from our epilepsy patients to try and understand these relationships um, from an electrophysiological perspective. So the reason for using um, intracranial EEG is that it provides a direct measure of neuronal activity um, where we have coverage in these areas of interest and also that it's not subject to limitations of scalp recordings that you see, such as um, smearing and loss of power that um, happens when it comes out through the skull. So just a brief outline of what I'm gonna go through. So first I'm gonna go over some of the work that we did with the raw intracranial EEG and then band power time series that were extracted from that, and then go into sort of the second spectrum relationships, what that means and sort of what motivated that study um, between default mode network locations and then other brain regions as well. So in terms of patient selection, um, we studied nine medically refractory epilepsy patients who underwent seizure localization and pre-surgical evaluation at Yale New Haven Hospital between 2003 and 2006. Um, the main selection criteria was just that they had to have contacts available in the anatomical regions of interest, so specifically default mode network locations. And of these nine patients, we had six female patients and they had a median age of 24. For each of these patients, we then selected a one-hour epic that was at least six hours removed from seizure when the patient appeared to be resting quietly with eyes open at night prior to sleep. Um, for each of these hour-long segments, we then um, manually removed noise and artifacts and sort of segments of data when the patient was engaged in other activities. So this could include um, interacting with nurses or uh, you know, drinking water or having a snack. And this left us with an average of 51.88 minutes of data per patient, with a minimum of 37.38 minutes and a maximum of 59.91 minutes. So then for each of these hour-long segments, we then calculated the band power time series for each segment at a one-second resolution in the frequency bands listed, so delta 0 to 4 hertz, theta 4 to 8 hertz, um, alpha 8 to 13 hertz, beta 13 to 25, gamma 25 to 55, and then higher frequencies between 65 and 128 hertz. So for our default mode network analysis, what we did was we selected contacts from two test areas that were within the default mode network, which we designated T1 and T2, and a control area that was roughly equidistant from those test areas, which we designated as C, or our control area. Um, T1 included contacts that were in anterior cingulate and orbital frontal cortex. Um, T2 was posterior cingulate and mesial parietal. Uh, C was superior temporal, temporal and or lateral frontal, depending on contacts availability in the individual patients. We also limited our analysis to pairs with intercontact distance between 5 and 12 centimeters. And the reason for this was because we didn't want to unduly bias our results for um, sort of spurious correlations that we would get for very low intercontact distance pairs. So this left us with 121 total contacts across the nine patients and a total of 403 contact pairs. Of those, 104 were T1, T2 pairs. Um, 148 were T1C pairs, and then 161 were T2C pairs. And then we separately, independently considered relationships, compared relationships between T1, T2 to T1C and T2C, and the measures that we used on this were magnitude squared coherence, mutual information, and then cross approximate entropy, which is sort of a bivariate measure of asynchrony between two time series. And so these results um, basically show that we have a fairly low level of relationship between the areas studied. So specifically, the first five plots, A through E, show um, alpha, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma magnitude squared coherence between the time series that we had extracted, and then also high frequencies. And then the last plots show mutual information, cross-FN, 
um, in the forward and reverse directions. And so what this seemed to show is that the relationships between T1, T2 um, aren't necessarily greater than the relationships that we observed between T1C and T2C. So this leads us into sort of the discussion about the second spectrum and why we wanted to look at that. So it's been suggested in sort of subsequent studies since uh, Dominique published the study in 2013 that uh, these low frequency changes in blood flow that we observe in the bold signal may actually be better reflected in synchronous amplitude modulation or sort of envelope correlations of the band power time series. So this is what we designated the second spectrum as these envelope correlations. And these studies were done using um, both MEG, EEG, and intracranial EEG as well. And sort of the consensus that came from these studies was that we should be looking at specifically modulations of the alpha, beta, and gamma bands. And so we chose to take our data and study second spectrum relationships in the intracranial EEG within these default mode network locations and then other brain regions as well. So the way we did this was we calculated magnitude squared coherence between these band power time series using a three minute windows and a 50% overlap and then a mean deletion performed on each individual segment. And because we were interested in low frequency modulations, we averaged this second spectrum coherence for frequencies less than 0.15 hertz, which is sort of the box area in this uh, example spectrum here, to give a single value that represented second spectrum relationship between each contact pair in a given frequency band. So before we applied this to any sort of real brain data, we wanted to understand the, sort of characterize the coherence estimator that we're using. And the reason for characterizing the second spectrum estimator would be to determine as inherent estimator bias and variance. Um, to do this, we generated pairs of white Gaussian noise signal that sort of mimic our band power time series so that they were out an hour long at a one second resolution. And we use these pairs of white Gaussian noise signals to test the effects of signal power and window overlap on the MSC estimate. We also generated pairs of surrogate raw intracranial EG signals using pink or one over F noise. And the way we did this was we again generated white Gaussian noise signals, but this time instead of using a one second resolution, we had a one hour signal that was at the same sampling frequency as our um, raw intracranial EG actual signal. And we performed an FFT on this white Gaussian noise signal, uh, applied a one over F filter, and then performed an inverse FFT. We then broke these signals down into um, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma bands, just like we did with our actual intracranial EG signals at a one second resolution, and then calculated these coherence estimates for those as well. And the reason for doing this would be to set a threshold for considering a coherence estimate significantly non-zero. So first we see the results of um, our characterization of the estimator using the pairs of white Gaussian noise signals. So each of these plots, eight plots, represents a thousand trials. And the, plot, the four plots on the left show the effects of signal power, and the plots on the right show the effects of window overlap. So if we look at signal power, um, these pairs of Gaussian noise signals are increasing. The first plot shows zero dB signals. The second plot shows 10 dB signals. Third is 25 and the fourth is 50 dB signals, and what we see is that signal power doesn't really have a huge effect on the bias invariance of our estimator. But the story gets a little bit different when we look at the window overlap, and what we see is that as you increase the window overlap within the coherence calculation itself, that you have a decrease in the bias and sort of um, a decrease in the variance to some extent as well as you increase the window overlap. So what these plots show is a 0% window overlap, 25%, 50%, and 75%. And we chose to use 50% uh, overlap just because it seems like there's sort of a lot of diminishing returns as you increase the overlap beyond, beyond that point. Um, these are results from the pink noise tests. So these were now over 10,000 trials instead of 1,000 trials. And what we saw was that in the individual frequency bands that our averages over um, these 10,000 trials were uniform across all the frequency bands and that it was a value of 0 0.027 with a standard deviation of 0 0.006. And the maximum estimate that we observed over these 10,000 trials was 0 0.06. And so what this gave us was a threshold for considering a coherence estimate significantly non-zero when we look at the actual brain data. So for our second spectrum DMN analysis, we again compared relationships between the same regions as we did with our raw intracranial EEG data and um, raw band power time series. 
but this time we also included all intrahemispheric contact pairs between 5 and 12 centimeters apart. So with the same intercontact distances, what we were looking at before. And this gave us 31,544 possible contact pairs across the nine patients. And so these plots show to, sort of show the results from our default mode network analysis in the second spectrum. And again, what we see is that the default mode network doesn't really show any enhanced relationship. Um, in all of these frequency bands, there was no significant difference between T1, T2, and T1C. And also it's important to note that in the beta and gamma bands, which are sort of two of those bands that were included in previous studies, the coherence estimates that we found on average were not above our noise threshold of 0 0.06. And so sort of based on that, they weren't really values that we could consider significantly non-zero. And then again in the alpha band, which was the other band that was sort of proposed to include these electrophysiological correlates, we again don't really see a significant difference between T1, T2, and T1C. So again, just to summarize, we don't really see any enhanced connectivity in the second spectrum in DMN locations. Um, importantly, the delta, theta, and alpha bands were the only bands in which the relationship was significantly non-zero. And then, again, that there's no unique relationship that we found in these locations. So we chose to extend sort of our second spectrum analysis to consider now every possible electrode contact pair in these patients. And so we calculated second spectrum coherence for every possible electrode contact pair and aggregated these estimates for all patients for each frequency band and examined how relationships in second spectrum vary with distance and frequency. So we did this in a couple of different ways. We first looked at all possible contact pairs, which gave us 59,959 pairs across the nine patients, and then also all intrahemispheric pairs, so just combinations from left to left and right to right. And so this gave us 46,370 intrahemispheric pairs. We also examined relationships between sort of different lobes of the brain, sort of broadly, and we looked at left and right frontal, medial temporal, temporal, parietal, and occipital. And um, for this analysis, we excluded contacts that could not be localized to a single lobe. So for example, if a contact was directly above, for example, the sylvian fissure that couldn't be um, localized between frontal and temporal, we excluded those in the analysis. And so this left us with 58,580 contact pairs for that analysis. So when we look at in each individual frequency band, the second spectrum coherence versus distance, you get sort of distribution that looks like this. So each um, point on this represents a single contact pair across these nine patients. And um, these show the five different frequency bands. So what we did was we took these values and binned them into one centimeter distance bins and then took the averages and saw sort of how those um, relationships change. And so what we see on the left here is the results from all electrode contact pairs, and the, result, the plot on the right shows just the intrahemispheric contact pairs. And so what we see is that the second spectrum relationships diminish with distance. We see a sharp decrease between 0 and 5 centimeters and a plateau sort of between 5 and 14. It also diminishes with increasing frequency. And so we see that the delta um, second spectrum has the highest coherence and then decreases as you go down or go up into gamma. Um, we also saw, if you look in the plot on the left, there's a small increase between 6 and 10 centimeters, which you don't see when you look at just the intrahemispheric pairs. And so we think that that small increase between 6 and 10 centimeters may be due to homologous sort of left and right brain regions where we had electrode contacts available and that sort of contributes to an uh, increase in the average coherence that we observe. So we also looked at um, second spectrum coherence between different lobes of the brain. And what we see is, I guess it's a little bit small, but what we see is that second spectrum um, coherence estimates are relatively higher for intralobar contact pairs, so within the same lobe. And again, we see this similar graded relationship with frequency where the lower frequencies have higher levels of relationship. So if you see the intralobar ones are the ones that are on the diagonal on each of these plots. Um, other things that seemed to stick out to us were that in the delta and theta bands, we see sort of enhanced relationship between left frontal and right frontal, frontal and parietal overall, and also between left temporal and right temporal pairs. Um, we also see relatively strong relationships in the occipital lobes and the alpha and beta bands from this. So just to summarize, we again see that we have strong relationships between contact pairs that were zero to two centimeters apart but the average coherence seems to decrease sharply in the second spectrum for greater intercontact distances. Um, we also see that relationships are strongest in the delta band and decrease with increasing frequency. 
And this suggests that sort of the generators for these different frequency bands may have their own spatial profile, with the delta band generator having sort of the broadest coherent spatial range. Um, we also see sort of enhanced frontal lobe coherence in the delta and theta bands, and relatively high relationship in the occipital lobes in the alpha and beta bands. So going back to sort of the default mode network analysis, there are a couple of considerations to take about um, why our intracranial EEG results are sort of discordant with a number of fMRI studies. Um, first of all, it's important to note that there are some distinct methodological limiting factors in the study that we did. So first of all, these are epilepsy patients. And so there's always sort of, there seems to be a risk of, um, in case the default mode network is changed in some way due to epilepsy, and that's not something that we're picking up, that could be a limiting factor in our analysis. Also, this was a retrospective analysis on sort of anal uh, analyzing sort of ongoing data, and patients weren't necessarily directed to be in a non-task state. Um, we also did not confirm DMN locations on these patients using fMRI. So in other words, the contact selection that we did was based on sort of what the literature says about where default mode network locations are, and then we selected these based on the anatomy of individual patients. We also um, did not correct coherence in any manner. So for, sorry, for example, um, with respect to intercontact distance, and the main reason for this was just because that those are sort of the relationships that we were interested in, and so we thought it would be better to look at just the magnitude squared coherence without any kind of correction. Um, another thing to consider is sort of, I guess, what we feel is a little bit more important is that fMRI and intracranial EEG measure different phenomena, and so this can be seen sort of in terms of temporal scales where fMRI is measuring very slow activity, whereas clinical intracranial EEG is measuring sort of fast activity. And so it's, um, we don't necessarily have a good way of reconciling those two and um, tracking electrophysiological correlates of um, fMRI signals. Uh, it's also important to note that there's sort of non-uniform relationships between the hemodynamic response and electrophysiological activity. This is reported in Qtel et al. in 2004, where they looked at event-related potentials and then corresponding hemodynamic changes. And so what this suggests is that um, the relationships between the hemodynamic response and electrophysiology may be a little bit more complex than just looking at corresponding frequencies in the intracranial EEG and looking at correlations between those. And so it could be um, sort of a more dynamic relationship than that. Um, the last thing is also that there could be multiple sources of low frequency fluctuations in the fMRI. And specifically, Razavi et al. in 2008 looked at low frequency fluctuations in fMRI, which were below 0 0.1 hertz. And they sort of swept between different sampling rates. And what they saw was that when you look at these low frequency fluctuations, that you tend to have artifacts that fold in and get aliased in as you decrease your sampling rate. And so this could include things like cardiorespiratory artifacts. And then what they noted as being sort of the main contributor was um, vasomotion. And so a lot of these things, it could be um, a lot of these things that sort of explain the discordance that we see between intracranial EG and fMRI in the second spectrum specifically. So just in terms of acknowledgments, thank you to um, the members of the Computational Neurophysiological Laboratory and Epilepsy Center at Yale University for their help. Um, thanks to the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to pr present this information. And also, thank you to the organizing committee and Wake Forest Med School for providing funding to come here and present. Thank you. Um, so this is coming from like sort of a very naive perspective about all of this, um, but I think that it may not necessarily be just a one-to-one -one mapping, just based on what we saw with the second spectrum when we were looking at sort of the corresponding frequencies below 0 0.15 hertz, which was sort of um, the same as the low frequency fluctuations in the fMRI. 
And so it seems to suggest that it may not necessarily be a one-to-one -one mapping, as you um, mentioned, but it could be something a little bit more complex. But I guess this is also coming from a naive perspective, and other people might be able to provide a better insight about that. I have a question. You mentioned several alternatives. Mm -hmm. Any idea how to test this? I'm not sure. <laughs> that would be an open thing. So, um, specifically in terms of, I guess, the low frequency fluctuations, I think um, I honestly don't have a good answer for you. Uh, that would be some. Then maybe. So, uh, in general, this is something that uh, we've been struggling with for a while, and I'm not sure we tackled it in the right form. Um, because the fMRI study, well, we didn't do fMRI and EEG on station for it. Um, but we don't see the robust correlation that's observed through the positive network or correlation or any relationship in the intercranial EEG at that distance. That's something we're struggling with. Because there's a limitation of the intercranial EEG in some manner. Um, that we did not, when we, when we are very, very careful about the estimating or about our measurements, we just don't see that relationship at a distance. That's the first thing that I, I don't know how to go about testing. Um, the, these are very different modalities, and I think it's pretty easy for us to say that we'll just slap them together. Um, there, there are profound questions that these, I mean, if we're correct here, then the you know, resting state network is not reflecting neural landscape. Um, I don't know what it reflects. For. The Rosali paper that Rosesh points out at the end is essentially arguing that those low frequency fluctuations are artifactual in the fMRI. They are because they're not, you know, keep in mind, the fMRI, you're doing time series analysis on imaging data. The signal does not go through a 98 filter, and because of that, you have components at one third and more, which might get folded down to very low frequency due to ADG, because you're just not sampling time So it's hard to bring these modalities together unless you have them on the same sort of basis that we have signals being anti here. Goes to an anti filter, sampled in similar manners, and you can start to then bring them together. Yeah, I think partially to answer your question, I, you have one of your experiments already up there, which is the, the looking at test, not test. And a lot of the original, if I remember correctly, so many monologists should correct me, but uh, a lot of the original resting state networks are actually worked out of comparison between resting state and not resting state. Right. And so maybe the robust correlations aren't there, but in a comparison, they would pop out more, more uh, strongly. And then just to remind me, I mean, I, when you went through it, I, I, I sort of missed it. How high, what were the highest frequencies you were looking at in terms of the envelope? And I, I asked, because I thought there was a paper from Corey Keller and, and Ash Mehta um, in New York looking at the same issue using grids uh, in patients who had had fMRI uh, uh, only measurement of the resting state. We did find some correlations on those that match what we found in control. But I think they were looking at the envelope of, of gamma activity, but fairly high gamma activity. Right, so um, th that could be sort of the reason for the difference. The gamma band that we were looking at was between 25 and 55 hertz, and so it wasn't necessarily looking at those higher frequencies. Um, but yeah, I think that... Right, exactly. Thanks, it's very interesting. Um, I suppose the um, comment I sometimes make on this is, you know, if you do a language task in the scan, you get really robust language activation network, but you don't see anything on scalp EG. It's not even clear to me what you see on intracranial EG. You might see a vocal potential if you average to 100 trials, but it's in no way the same time frame or the same scale. Um, so it doesn't bother me that, you know, we're not seeing it, and it'd be really a question as to whether the EEG is capable of detecting these low frequency oscillations, or certainly the way we're measuring the EEG. Maybe if you had some other measure, I don't know, don't have time, I've got no idea. But to me, it argues that the EEG, as measured, is not capable of detecting the real phenomena of slow frequency oscillations in brain activity, rather than fundamentally questioning the validity that these are slow oscillations, oscillations occurring. The other comment, I suppose, was just whether it's possible 
probing it work. I mean, some of the work that Mark has done with this sort of probing the epileptic network, I think, is really interesting. Rather than waiting for the vagaries of oscillations, probe the network and see how well your probe response appears in the other end of the Volvo network. And I bet you if you did that, you'd see a much better link between the regions than between these other regions. Yeah, so um, just in response to your first question or first comment, uh, I think that speaks to the sort of different temporal scales that we're looking at with fMRI and intracranial EG. It could be very well that sort of the passband of intracranial EG that we use in the clinic doesn't necessarily include those very slow fluctuations that you see in um, fMRI. And then on your second point, I think it shows the importance of using sort of a prospective approach and looking at instead of doing retrospective analysis, now doing prospective approaches and seeing if we can find those kinds of correlates. Yeah, I think that's definitely possible. And I think um, that's definitely something that should be studied. It's not something that we looked at, but it would, I think, definitely provide some useful information. Uh, I have not seen that. I don't know. Define, define inverse correlation. Define decreased connectivity in one modality and increased connectivity in the other. I see. Uh, decreased connectivity in one modality and increased connectivity in the other. E E T T U S. E E T T U S. Okay. Definitely something to be looked at. Yeah. Okay. I have no further questions. Then thank all the speakers again.